Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Comeback Podcast with your host, Mark Jennison. And today, coming all the way from Australia, which I just learned it's also Australia Day, which is like our 4th of July, we have Sharon Mitchell. How are you today? I'm really well. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Thanks for, uh, I don't know, what time is it there? It's 10 in the morning. 10 in the morning. All right. Yeah. How, how hot? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think, uh, well, we're about 35 degrees in um, Celsius, so maybe close to 100-ish, your temperatures. I, yeah. we're, we're like <laughs> in the 20s, 20 degrees here, which is freezing, so. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right, so um, the, the purpose of me having you on here is uh, I came across you in the ClickFunnels group a couple of weeks ago, and you've been more than helpful with me as I've transitioned from being this car guy into this <laughs> whatever I'm doing right now. No, I don't, but the comeback movement yeah. and helping men free themselves from, from alcohol and uh, live a better life. But mm -hmm. I saw some really cool things. I just wanted to have you on there because I don't have a huge uh, woman audience, but that doesn't yes. really mean that something you say can't re get something out of these men, right? Yeah, correct. So do me a favor real quick and share with my audience some of your, uh, just some of your story. Okay. So, um, born in Australia, obviously, and um, was brought up in a family that was quite poor and decided very early on that um, making money was the way to be happy, <laughs> um, as many of us do in our childhood. So, I literally did all the normal things people do, get married, had kids, but in the process of that, um, my then husband was very also committed to making money. And we were very hard workers and we built up our own business. And um, by the time we were in our early 30s, we had a multi-million dollar um, finance business with 50 staff and huge mansion up on the hill and three European cars and the children in, I had twins and they were, you know, in the best private school in the city and all of that. But at the same time as that, I had a very healthy drinking career. <laughs> and um, so I am what's called a high functioning alcoholic. So um, right from my early teenage years, I drank and I always drank like an alcoholic. I have never, I've never in my life had one glass of wine or two drinks or even three drinks. I, I drank and got drunk the first time I had a drink and then I got drunk every single time I drank after that. Um, I was a daily drinker within a couple of months of when I first started drinking as a teenager, but I could drink and function very highly. And so people knew that I was a big drinker, but because I was so high functioning, you know, my kids were the kids at school, the earliest with the neatest packed lunch and the most ironed uniforms, you know, and I could, I could host a party for 150 people at my house with no problems at all and no one would even think I'd had more than a glass of wine, you know. Um, I was just very functioning at home and at work and in the community. Anyway, um, that all came crashing down um, when my twins were 12. I was 38 years old and I had a, what I call my emotional rock bottom when I realised that what I'd been working for my whole life, which was the money and the status and the business and all of those things that I had thought in my youth were going to make me happy, I realised I had them all and I wasn't happy. So for me, that was an emotional rock bottom because, and that was probably my biggest moment because I actually didn't have the emotional capacity to understand what to do with that information. You know, I recognised that what I'd been working for was not going to make me happy, but I had no, no fathomable idea of what I would do about that. So I did what most good alcoholics do and I, I basically just tried to kill myself with alcohol. And I, from that minute of that, that realisation, I drank 24-7 for the next three months. And that's the... Um, the period that my husband called an inverted commas when I dropped the ball. And that was the only period in my life when I haven't been high functioning. And I literally just drank 24 seven, didn't get out of bed without a drink, didn't move, didn't. And really I, I was in a blackout for that pretty much that entire three months. And I just have very small recollections of kind of periods like of half an hour or 10 minutes here or there. My kids are very happy to share with me any of those, <laughs> anything I forget. Um, anyway, then at the end, last two weeks of my drinking, I had three alcoholic seizures and at 
the last seizure, they uh, the lot doctor leaned over me and said um, two things that I'll never forget. And he said, Sharon, you're an alcoholic, and you're going to die probably tonight. So to me, that was amazing because all these years I'd been drinking like an alcoholic, which by that stage was nearly 20 years. And that was the first time anyone ever called me an alcoholic. Wow. So it was one, I mean, that, that was the first and biggest lesson for me is that our idea of what an alcoholic is or anyone who struggles with their drinking in our society, see, people still think that someone who struggles with their drinking is someone who is an old homeless guy on a park bench drinking out of his brown paper bag. And that is by far not the definition of what an alcoholic is or even anyone who's struggling with their drinking. So long story short, my family were brought in to say their goodbyes. My children remember that day obviously very clearly because the doctor was very clear on the fact that I would, I would die. And, and I quote, we don't put alcoholics on a transplant list or active alcoholics, I should say. Um, and whether that's a worldwide policy, I don't know, but it was where I was. Right. Anyway, um, amazingly, I survived, obviously. And um, they did put me in the emergency section of the detox unit thinking I would die within, you know, I now know it's very common knowledge that you generally die in your withdrawal symptoms in the first three days when you're as, as bad as I was. Um, so after three days, they did say to me, hey, you're over the danger period and, and you, you can live. So that was a whole new thing for me because I had never, um, as an adult, I, I had no, you know, no, I had no starting point, no basis to know how to live life without alcohol. So, yeah, great, amazing new opportunity, but scary and all of those things. So I knew that I had to do life differently in order to, um, you know, go forward and not, not die. And I knew I had to do it without alcohol. So in a way, I think I'm lucky because for me, alcohol is no longer an option. Um, and it never was, even in those early days, because I, I know for me to drink is to die sooner rather than later. And so maybe that gave me the, you know, impetus to do something quicker or more drastically. But anyway, I threw myself, in, I'm an overfunctioner, so I threw myself into, into this journey, as all good overfunctioners do. And um, yeah, and so that was nearly 11 years ago. I've never picked up a drink since. Awesome. Um, I did initially go to AA and I did, um, I did use support mechanisms like that. But um, for me, I also recognised the fact that it had to be deeper than the fact of, that this was, alcohol was kind of more the symptom of, of you know, me and, my, and the fact that I, the emotional growth that I had um, that that was really what I needed to work on was was that really big crux from that um, that moment of that rock bottom of mine when I'd said I don't know how to be happy, and that's what I really had to get back to. So, yeah, so that's what I did, and the process for me, as it does for a lot of women, more women than men, um, the process of changing um, changing the way you drink can often mean changes in relationships, and a lot of women do end up getting divorced, and that was part of my journey. Um, I'm super lucky though, because my ex-husband and I are great friends and still co-parent our kids very well. Um, but yeah, that was all part of my journey and as was following my passion and deciding that I wanted to help other women who also struggle with their alcohol so, use. How long did it take for you to decide you want to start helping women from the time you beat death, right? Since you cheated death. And yeah. Then, like how um, long, that immediate? It was pretty immediate, yeah, because I straight away knew that the finance, which I had 100% been working in to, to make money because it's a great money-making venture, but it was never my passion. And I immediately knew that money was not the thing that was going to keep me happy. And so I stepped away from that pretty quickly and started and I got qualified. I did qualifications both in alcohol counselling but then headed more towards the coaching because that is the thing that I recognised this was... I'm more about um, results. You know, I'm a very results-focused person. And so for me, that meant more working with women in, in a coaching kind of arena rather than old school counselling. Um, yeah, so that's sort of where I headed. And then I was volunteering in the local prison with women who were struggling with their alcohol use within, oh, before I'd been a year sober. And then it kind of uh, went from there. But then I was um, about five years sober when I started travelling the world. My kids were all grown up by then. And I started doing um, volunteer work in developing nations. 
And initially, I thought they'd want to know about the finance side of things. But as it turned out, they were, they were also, I started to realise that alcohol is actually a problem all around the world, which now I know to be a fact. Um, so in the developing nations I was in, and I've done, you know, Africa, um, India, Southeast Asia, like a whole lot of places where I've gone and worked and helped with the alcohol there. And um, that, that really, um, for me, became a journey of realising that this was bigger than uh, the one-on-one -on -one work I was doing with the coaching. And I really thought that um, it was as if we had a huge tsunami of this issue, you know, in the world. And anyone who was working one-on-one -on -one with people was standing there with a teacup, kind of t catching the drips, you know, instead of, instead of putting up a tsunami warning sign. And so at that time, I didn't know what I could do about it, but I did think that a one-to-many kind of um, business model would be a better way to go. So then um, I started working on that and here we are three years later. So I've had... About 33,000 women have used my information to one extent or another to change the way they're drinking. And I've had um, nearly 6,000 women through my actual um, full-on programs. That's awesome. Can, yeah. you, can you tell a little, a little bit about, uh, it's called Flourish, right? Yeah, that's my full-on program. So that's a membership program which has a number of my video coaching programs and audio more along the counselling level programs. Um, but what I'm very strong about is not talking in, form, in the form of addiction, but more in any woman who is struggling with their alcohol use or would like to make a positive change to the way she drinks. So one of the many things I've discovered, and this, this stands for men and for women, is that um, alcohol is actually the third biggest killer in the world. And it actually um, kills about 4 million people a year, wow. which is more people per day die from their alcohol use than died in the whole Ebola, inverted commas, crisis. That's the whole crisis. More people die every single day from alcohol use. And that number is growing. It's not decreasing. So... Um, yeah, so, and then what I also found out is that most people have a perception with, with alcoholism and with, with alcohol abuse that, every, that there's a, a huge amount of people in the world who drink inverted commas normally, and then there's the people who are the, the alcoholics. But in actual fact, about 94% of people who have health-related issues because of their drinking are actually not alcoholic or dependent on alcohol. So these are people who what we would call maybe normal drinkers are actually the bulk of the people who are suffering. Um, so it's not only a community cost, but it's also, it's also a cost that people are being ignorant to because they think that the only people who need to worry about it is when someone is in addiction and... We, had, we do have a lot of addiction services and many of those are free, but there's very little services within that um, other area, um, yeah, of, of people who, who are just struggling, you know, with their, with their alcohol use in general. Right. So you're, and I know this from speaking to you before, but your main goal is to help people change their relationship with alcohol. And you do have a success rate though, right, where people decide to quit, correct? Yes, correct. Yeah, I, I, what I do is I get, I'm all about giving people the information. So I'm about um, giving them the information that they need to decide whether or not they, or I do explain to people about um, alcoholism and how it works. And when you're someone like me, yes, the absolutely 100% only way for me and a true alcoholic to go is to, to be abstinent from alcohol for the rest of your life. And I, I definitely give people the information they need so that if that's the case for them, then that's the way they decide to go. And I give them the tools to do that. But by the same token, if some people do go through that process and work out that really they've been a heavy drinker and they haven't yet hit the whole alcoholic um, you know, side of the spectrum, then they learn how to just incorporate alcohol in a, in a safer way within their um, diet. Okay, in your opinion, how does one know? So for me, one mm -hmm. drink, like I didn't just go out. I'm like you said, I never went out with my buddies to have a yeah. 
if I went out, yeah. it was going to be a seven month bend, month bender, and I was going yeah. completely crazy, right? Like I didn't yeah. care, and yeah. I was still functioning and making millions of dollars and building companies and doing all these things, yeah. like yeah. yourself. Yeah. But for the person out there, male uh-huh. that probably watched this, is on the uh-huh. fence. It doesn't know if he's an alcoholic, uh-huh. right? Yes. Yes. Any any key indicator that you could questions they could ask themselves? Yeah, there are some key indicators, including the fact that. If you have tried to stop drinking before and it hasn't worked, that really is one of the best indicators. So someone who doesn't, someone who isn't an alcoholic doesn't have so much trouble stopping. So I actually have traveled the world and spoken with a lot of experts. I've been very lucky to get the time from a lot of experts in this area and particular experts who deal with working out who is actually an alcoholic and who could successfully cut back. And one of the biggest, the biggest um, or the most successful method they find for working it out is to set yourself goals and whether those are goals for particular days of the week you will drink, particular amounts you will drink no more than, and particular things you won't drink if you know that there are particular things that get you in trouble. Set yourself those goals attempt to achieve those goals for the week if you don't achieve goals three times then really you need to look at abstinence as your goal i was just gonna say doesn't that sound like a lot of work yes (laughs) (laughs) and this is the thing for someone who doesn't struggle with their alcohol use that is not a lot of work because that that's exactly the thing Right, because you can know pretty quickly that but you're going to be I'm like, okay. Well, I'm not. I'm already going to fail. All right. You know, exactly, I, and that's like me. And people say that to me. I'm like, it seems like hard work to me. I just give up. Right. Yeah, <laughs> get started is down exactly the right. Yeah, that's exactly right. But a lot of people do need that process, and it depends for them. I mean, I'm sure you might you may have already done this research, but. The way the human behaviour works is that we actually go through a a process which is called a stages of change process whenever we're making any emotional change. You know, it's part of our habit breaking and habit change process for anything we do. But basically, when you move up that stages of change, that's what in the addiction circles they will call hitting your rock bottom which means that place when you actually know, when you're actually getting more pain from the behaviour that you're doing than you're getting, than the fear of the pain that's coming ahead by making that change. When you're in that place, that's the place that we would call a rock bottom. But that's really where you need to be to actually make that decision and say, okay, I am 100% committed to abstinence and to stopping altogether. But sometimes people need to go through that process before they realize that that's where they are. Does that I, make sense? I mean, yeah, it, for me, yeah. for me, the, to check that would have been too much work. So, and my thing was, I kept seeing how low I could get my rock bottom. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> A like lot of us do that. How yeah. many millions of dollars that I have to lose? I, how many yeah. drugs that I have to do? How many drink? I mean, my, I had both problems, right? Drugs and, and yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, rock bottom was a place that I just, it kept getting lower, so I never thought I hit it. No, yeah. that's right. You know, you know, they call that dragging along the dirt instead yeah. of hitting the rock. And that, that hurts. Like, I reckon dragging along the dirt is bad. I just yeah. want to get off that rock bottom. <laughs> yeah, I just want to bounce out as quick as possible now and stay yeah. away. But yeah. all right, so um, I've got a couple of minutes here. I don't want to keep it too much because it's Australia Day for you. But <laughs> give my guys, um, well, guys, men, women who are out there, give them some three tips maybe just to, stay positive they are in their drinking maybe they're maybe they're on the edge about trying to take that test that you just told them just three tips yeah. maybe keep them yeah. going down the path and maybe take uh, a look at changing their sobriety or being abstinent yeah i mean i will say a few things is one is to understand that alcohol is actually a poison unlike sugar where they say it's a poison it's not really a poison i'm not saying it's good for you but it's not alcohol is a poison and it's listed as a carcinogenic by the World Health Organization, right? All of the research that's been done will tell you that there is, there is no such thing as no risk drinking. All drinking holds risk. So to remember that it, just because drinking and drinking what our society considers normal is normal, it's still not healthy. 
it's still not healthy. And that's always a good thing to remember that there's a lot of positive change you can make in your life by making small changes to your drinking. The second thing I'd say is if you're not sure, go abstinent. And if you don't think that you want to be abstinent for the rest of your life, there are so many health benefits involved in actually just going abstinent, detox your body, clear your mind, clear your body, do all of that stuff. No one's got anything to lose by that. And then the third thing I would say, and this is possibly the least thing that gets spoken about, is the thing that we all have to remember is any of us, whether we're the most normal social drinker right through to an alcoholic, the reason we drink is to change the way we feel. So we all have to remember that. Whether that's just that you're having a drink after work on a Friday night to relax, right through to an alcoholic who wants to completely wipe themselves out and numb themselves. The thing we have to remember is that we're trying to change the way we feel. So I can 100% guarantee that anyone, whether they are an alcoholic or a social drinker or anything in between, if you don't address the feelings that you are trying to numb or change behind your drinking, you will either go back to drinking the amounts you were or you will swap that for something else. Now, for women, it's often food. For men, it's often other things. There are more gambling and sex that gets involved in that area. But we, so, we are so quick to stop our drinking, not deal with the issues behind it and not look at those feelings. And then all we're doing is ending up with another pile of rubbish that we've just changed one addiction or bad habit for another. So biggest advice I ever say to anyone is, sure, the first thing is to change the way you're drinking. Second thing, deal with those feelings. Awesome. I like that. I really appreciate you doing that. Yeah. I, do, I do want to say real quick, two of my best drinking mates when I was younger living in California were from Australia. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. yeah we, know, we know how to drink down here. <laughs> yeah, they were fun. They were wild. They were some good dudes. Yeah, yeah. Where I live in, in the United States, I'm in Wisconsin, which is the biggest drinking state in the state. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, Sharon, where can my, my listeners, maybe they're, I've got some dudes whose husband or wife's might be struggling yep. to want to watch this. Where can we, where can they find you? Or even if it's not, let's reach out to you. Where can easily you? on SharonMitchell.com. Okay. Yeah. That's the easiest way. Facebook That's, links you right to everything. Yeah, correct. Awesome. Yeah. Would you, would you mind giving my guys some parting words before we head out? Well, I'm heading to America next month, I think. So hopefully get to catch up with you there. But I guess the biggest thing for everyone is men and women and our drinking is remember you are worth making this positive change. I love that. Sharon, yeah. thank you so much for taking your time out. I know that you got some stuff to do today and I appreciate you being on the Comeback Podcast with me. Okay, lovely to talk to you. Thank you. Okay, see you later. Yeah.